Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises sing. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Some of you know this song. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. How many of you know that song? Let me see your hands. If you raised your hand, my guess is you grew up inside the church. It's been a while since I have sung that song inside a church building. It is a beautiful old church hymn. If you, maybe today is your first time here at Venture, we are wrapping up a sermon series today. It's been a five-week series, and it's called... Recovering Pharisees like me. Hi, my name is Stan, and I happen to be a recovering Pharisee most days. Some days I relapse. I'll tell you more about that here in a minute. That song, I love that song. I have so many fond memories of that song. But my title today, the title of this message, get this, is Stop. Stop standing on the promises. Now, before you throw a tomato at me or tar and feather me or whatever you're reacting to in your heart of hearts right now, let me simply acknowledge that for those of us who grew up inside the walls of a church building, that's a provocative title. I get it. My mom would probably want to wash my mouth out with soap right now. What are you talking about? Stop. Stand. My grandparents would look at me like I'm crazy. What do you mean? Now, before I start picking apart a beautiful old hymn that I deeply love, that I deeply appreciate, let me make it super clear. I, I'm a Bible guy. I, I am. I love God's Word so much so that I, I feel like I've dedicated most of my adult life to studying God's Word. I want to understand more, not as an end in and of itself, but as a means to an end. I'll talk about that more here in just a little bit. I want to make it super clear. Here at Venture, we are a Bible church. Let me show this to you. About four years ago, uh, a group of our leaders got together and we spent some time just wrestling through what is our mission, what is our vision as a church, and what are the core values that are like bedrock that we want to build everything on. And we came up with five core, core values for our church. Check it out. Here they are. Number one, right at the top of the list, biblical authority. We are a Bible church. Right after that. Prayerful dependence on God. We don't want to be a church that prays, but we want to be a praying church. Do you see the distinction there? Everything we do, let's spend some time exploring. God, what, what would you have us do in this? How about this? Continued spiritual growth. We're basically saying let, it doesn't matter where you are on the spiritual growth continuum, where you are in your walk with Jesus in the, through the lens of Philippians, where Paul says, I continue to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, what we're doing is process-oriented. We have room to grow. doesn't matter where you're at, you have room, well, to get closer to Jesus, to be more like Jesus tomorrow than you are today. This is a core value of our church, con uh, continued spiritual growth. Outward-focused impact. We've been talking about this all year long. You're probably sick of hearing me ask you, how are you doing with your one? You have one life to invest. Who's the one life you're investing in? We recognize that what we do when we gather together on a Sunday morning, we sing some songs, we open up God's word. This is worship, yes, but he calls us to worship with our entire lives. What are we doing the rest of the week out there? What kind of an impact are we having in a world that desperately needs to see Jesus in you, through you? Outward-focused impact. Genuine hospitality. Oh, my goodness, we want to be real people who know one another and practice well the one another's that we find in Scripture, to love one another, to bear one another's burdens, to speak the truth in love to one another. There's a whole list of them. That's a brilliant study sometime, but this is, this is hospitality, genuine hospitality. How do we live life together in real ways? Could I circle back around biblical authority? I want to make sure we're crystal clear on what we mean by that today. 
Because if we're not careful, if we view this through the same lens that the Pharisees did, we're probably out of balance in the area of biblical authority. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to spend the rest of our time together today unpacking that. Can I say it this way? If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. We shouldn't stand on Scripture. That song we sang, it's a beautiful old hymn. And listen, when I first heard that phrase and had this absurd image in my brain when I was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, we're singing this song and I'm thinking, standing on the promises, and I'm literally picturing standing on the Bible, I know. I just wasn't nuanced yet at, at eight years old. I didn't get the poetic language that the singer-songwriter was employing there. I get it. But there is something, I think, taken to the extreme when we stand on the promises. Well, we shouldn't do that. Why? Because that's what the Pharisees did. We're going to explore that with the rest of the time that we have today. Let me show you a case in point where they stood on Scripture, in my opinion, in a very unhealthy way. We've been talking through this whole series that there are 613 laws rules, guidelines in the Old Testament that the Pharisees were very rigid in their following of all 613 of these rules. And their heart, their head for sure, I don't know about their heart, but their desire was, well, do that. And if you break one of those, well, I caught you being bad. I mean, John chapter 8. We're going to spend our time together today in John chapter 8. Then we're going to go back a few chapters to John chapter 5. In John chapter 8, there's this story where Jesus, where is he? Well, he's in church. We find him at the beginning of John chapter 8 in the temple. He went to the Mount of Olives, verse 2, at dawn he appeared again in the the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. I'm not putting this on the screen. I just want you to hear this. Absorb this. Here's the cast of characters. The verse continues. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, that's the group we're studying, brought in a woman, uh, this phrase, caught in the act of adultery. I don't want to get graphic, but I've got all kinds of questions about that phrase. Like, for example, who was... The Pharisees had like a spy? Like, who was it that caught this, that saw this? And then if you continue to read the story, you see an image here of this woman literally getting dragged in before Jesus. Maybe she's dragged in by her clothing. Maybe they've got a hold of her arm. I don't know. Maybe they're dragging her by the hair. But they're bringing her in before Jesus. Literally, she was caught in the act of adultery. Oh, I've got all kinds of questions. Last I checked, it takes two to tango. My other question is, where is the dude in this? And who was committing adultery? I mean, was she married? Was he married? Were both of them married? What's going on here? Why isn't he in this conversation as well? But could you imagine her shame caught in the act? And now she's standing before Jesus. And they say, hey, the Old Testament is very clear. There are 613 laws. Verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Let's pick up a rock. Let's throw rocks at her head until she's dead. That's what she deserves, right? And it's almost as if it's, aha, we caught you. Now, teacher, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. And then the text says Jesus bent down and he starts drawing in the dirt. Some scholars have suggested that maybe he's actually detailing their sin. Which one of those 613 sins have they broken? Maybe even that morning already. And then he says this, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then I love this in verse 9, those who heard began to go away one at a time. This phrase is interesting to me, the older ones first. Almost as if those with a little bit more wisdom, with life experience, they realized, oh, he's got us on that. They disappear into the background And the younger ones still hopped up on righteous indignation and anger. They are the last to leave. Finally, they're all gone. Jesus looks at the woman, and he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Well, then neither do I condemn you. 
Now go and leave your life of sin. We shouldn't stand on Scripture. I would suggest to you that's exactly what the Pharisees are doing in that moment. They're saying, I caught you being bad. I see what you did. I'm standing on Scripture now, and I'm pointing to the fact that you, you broke the law. We shouldn't stand on Scripture. That's what the Pharisees did. Rather, we should live under Scripture. Do you see the difference in the posture here? Standing on Scripture versus opening it up almost as if it's an umbrella of grace and walking around and living underneath it. Do you see the difference in that posture? I want to work today on that vertical balance between there and here and where we may be even caught in the middle of those two options. We should live under Scripture. Why? Well, that's what Jesus seekers do. And again, through a lens of continual spiritual growth, we are seekers. I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. I want to know more of his goodness tomorrow than I know today. I want to get more of him into my life tomorrow than I have today. I'm a spiritual seeker. I'm a Jesus seeker. I want to live under Scripture. What's the difference? Standing on Scripture, living under Scripture, I think the difference has a lot to do with the tone. The Pharisees show up with rocks at church. Jesus has a quiet sin confrontation. Did you see that? They both were speaking of sin. Aha, we caught you. Let's throw rocks at you until you're dead. Jesus has a quiet conversation with with her. Did, Did you see how it ended? He says at the end, where's everybody? Have they left? Yeah, well, then neither do I condemn you. And then he says, now go, go and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more, another translation would say it. He's still talking about sin. He's speaking the truth in love there. I would argue that this is living under Scripture. And I want to find some balance in our lives in that today. If you want to turn back three chapters, we were just in John chapter 8. I would invite you to go to John chapter 5. I'm going to put this one up on the screen. We studied a story a few weeks ago in the middle of this series where Jesus heals a blind man. Where? At the pool of Siloam. He breaks the law, one of those 613 laws in the Old Testament. We'll see what here in just a minute. He's getting ready to do it again. I'm in John chapter 5, verse 1. Here we go. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, which, by the way, he was leaving Galilee. He was heading south. It's kind of weird. He's going up when he's actually going down on the map, right? Well, actually, he's literally going up in elevation. I love that. Jerusalem is a little bit higher. He's going up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the pool of Siloam. This is a different pool. This one has all kinds of... Greek and Roman architecture surrounding it. There's even some details here in the text, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. People are hanging out there, people who are desperate for a miracle. The reason why they're there, by the way, is there's a, there's a, a temple to a false god not too far from there where people believe in kind of the local voodoo that, hey, listen, if I go and be a part of this and maybe do these things, then maybe I could be healed. Check out who's hanging out there. Let's keep reading. There was a great number of disabled people who used to lie there, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who had been there had been a, an invalid for 38 years. He's 38 years old, and most of his adult life, he's drug himself to this pool, desperate, waiting for a miracle. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, yeah, 38 years is a long time, he asked him, and this is the important question, every good therapist would ask you this question, do you want to get well? Do you want to do what it's going to take to get well? I think he's asking this not just through a lens of, are you willing to do the work? But Jesus knows that the Pharisees, like vultures, are just kind of hanging out in the background, and they're just waiting to pounce on this story. We looked at the story at the Pool of Siloam a few weeks ago. Remember, what was Jesus guilty of? (sighs) 
he hawked up a loogie, he made some mud, and with that act, he used that to heal the blind man's eyes, and the Pharisees said, aha, you just, we caught you being bad. They stood on scripture and said, aha, we caught you being bad, you just worked on the Sabbath, shame, shame on you. They're lurking in the background here. Let's see, Jesus said to him, get up. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Uh Uh-oh. At once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place, though, was a Sabbath. Shabbat shalom. You just broke the peace of the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, you talk about splitting hairs and detailing, like majoring in minor, minors. The dude has been laying there for 38 years. And you're saying, why did you pick up your mat and walk? Why did you work on the Sabbath? You just broke, aha, we caught you being bad. He replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And by the way, I would have done anything he told me to do. And so would you. So they asked him, well, who is this fellow with who... Who told you to pick up your mat and walk? They've moved on. This time, Jesus is guilty of promoting disobedience in others. He worked the story we looked at before. Well, today, he's encouraging others to break the law of the Sabbath. Jesus gets into this long conversation, and he starts talking about who he is. He's God. And there's all kinds of layers to this conversation. Skip down to verse 16. Because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My Father, God, is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. What would you expect me to be doing? He's above the law. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal to God. If you skip down to verse 36, check this out. He's speaking and he's talking about what he's here to do. He's getting to the purpose. He says in verse 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John. He's talking about John the Baptist in verses before this. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. I'm here literally on a mission from God, and the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice. Who is he speaking to here? He's speaking to the Pharisees. You talk about a slap in the face. He's telling them, you've never heard from God. You've never heard his voice, nor have you seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For a bunch of religious leaders, he just slapped them in the face. For you do not believe the one he sent. Jesus is saying, I'm standing right here in front of you, and you've missed it. You've missed the opportunity of a lifetime that's staring you in the eyeballs right now, and then we're going to look at this the rest of our time together. You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. You're standing on the promises of Scripture. You're studying those so careful. And then he goes on and says this. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You think life is found in the words. Oh, the life is found in me, and I'm staring at you right in the face. It's subtle, but it's there. We don't stand on Scripture. We live under it. And I want to spend the rest of the time we have parsing that out. I want to examine our hearts, if I can, through a slightly different angle, maybe a different question. And this is personal. I would invite you to go inward. You're the only one that can answer this question for yourself. As you think about God's Word, as you think about the Bible, do you treat your Bible as one of two things? Do you treat your Bible as a destination, an end in and of itself? I'm pushing back. If you grew up in the church This gets into some of those things we learned in Sunday school when we were little kids. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Yeah. If you're seeking life in the Scriptures, 
Jesus himself. But if this is a, a destination in and of itself, I've just checked this off my list. I got my Bible study for the day done. Check what's the next thing. If this is simply a destination, that's a problem. Maybe, maybe this is adventures in missing the point. Or do you treat your Bible as a vehicle? You know what a vehicle is. You climb in it. It's really a means to an end. You're going to use that to get somewhere. The Bible, don't treat it simply as a destination. It is a vehicle. A destination would say, listen, I've arrived. By the way, if that's the way you view your Bible, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but that could be an idol. You're putting that even above Jesus. If it's a vehicle, you're saying, I'm using it to move toward Jesus. My Bible then drives me to worship. I know what you're thinking. Come on, Pastor Stan. That's just semantics. You're picking too much at this. Am I? Let's look at our text again. Verse 39, John chapter 5. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Could I suggest to you the Pharisees, they had probably created their own little heaven on earth. Here's 613 laws. Follow them. Don't just follow them, but here's a, a, a rule underneath them that we'll use to explain that. Maybe even a rule underneath that one to second guess this one. We'll create this little system of laws, and if you live by this, then we have arrived. Welcome to heaven on earth. And it sounds, it sounds like a miserable existence. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Jesus says, you're staring me in the eyeballs and you refuse to come to me to have life. I'm here to give it to you. Don't miss it. I'm staring you in the face. In my opinion, we're out of balance here. Could I end this series in the same place where we started it? We looked at a survey, a Barna survey. Scared me to death. I shared this with you about five weeks ago. We put it up on the screen. And basically it's saying, here's a, a whole series of questions Ten years ago that the Barner Research Group asked Christians, and, um, well, their findings were this. The findings reveal that most self-identified Christians in the U.S. are characterized by having the attitudes and actions researchers identified as pharisaical. Not Christ-like, <laughs> but the group of people that Jesus seemed to have an awful lot of beef with. Just over half of the nation's Christians, using the broadest definition of that word Christian, qualify for this category 51%. They tend to have attitudes and actions that are characterized by self-righteousness. Oh, that stings. By the way, I've got that survey, an article about it, linked in your sermon notes in the app if you want to go there. If you have not yet read that, check it out. You'll see there are even some in graph form. You can see how we stack up, uh, like this graph. 51% do not have the attitudes or actions of Christ. Rather, the attitudes of the Pharisees were aiming for here, and this is really where we camp out. There's another graph in there that would show how we stack up across all the different groups of Christians, and I don't want to take time to unpack that, but here's the bottom line is we have a problem here, and the point is this is 10 years old. I think we've actually lost some ground since that survey was conducted. I propose to you that part of our problem, according to the text we just looked at, is destination thinking. We view the Bible as an end in and of itself, rather than a means to an end to get closer to Jesus. And we've piled some baggage on top of that over the last 10 years. Can I share with you the questions that we wrestled through and that were part of the survey itself 10 years ago? We put these up on the screen a few weeks ago. Let's look at them right now. Self-righteous actions. I tell others the most important thing in my life is following God's rules. Remember, we're seeking to find balance here. Somewhere, some vertical balance between standing on God's promises and living under Scripture. We're seeking a balance between those two things right now. The problem is we get stuck in the middle so oftentimes thumping our Bibles. You're familiar with that phrase maybe? Bible thumpers? What this survey reveals is that this is exactly how culture views us. We're stuck in the middle between standing 
and living under, and we're thumping our Bibles at them. I want to follow God's rules. Here you go. How about you? I don't talk about my sins or struggles. That's between me and God. Thumping scripture. I try to avoid spending time with people who are openly gay or lesbian. I mean, you could pick any sin that you want to pick. Do we spend time judging people from arm's length distance rather than engaging with them? That's another form of thumping your Bible. How about I like to point out those who do not have the right theology or doctrine. You're wrong, I'm right. I prefer to serve people who attend my church rather than those outside the church. All of these rules get into the way. We could look not just at self-righteous actions, but take a step back at the attitudes even before that. And I would encourage you, if you looked through all of those, you would see that there, you could, each one of those, you could say it's possible, it's possible that thumping the Bible gets in the way. Let's look at even the things we are aiming at, attitudes that are more like Jesus. Between here and there, I need to point out to you that Jesus is the destination. Your Bible is simply a vehicle. And if you look at all of those uh, things, these actions like Jesus, you could look. Let's put those up on the screen. If you look at those things, I listen to others to learn their story before telling them about my faith. Or do I thump the Bible first? Each one of these, you could look at it and say, there's a Bible thumper underneath the reason why we're not answering that correctly. And if you back up a step, not just the actions that are like Jesus, but even the attitudes, the way we think like Jesus. I see God-given value in every person, regardless of their past or present condition. Go ahead and put that one up. You could look all through that list, and you could see that each one of those, there's a Bible thumper that could get in the way of people seeing Jesus in us and seeing Jesus through us. Again, we're seeking some vertical balance, somewhere between here, standing on, here, living under, but let's make sure we don't thump the Bible at them in the middle. Are you tracking with me? Bible study, if you're taking notes, write this down. Bible study is important. One of these days, I'm going to preach a series and I'm going to title it, What's Not in the Bible? I recognize that there's a tension here between, oh my goodness, we are in a lot of ways biblically illiterate, and at the same time I'm saying, let's not make the Bible an idol. Let's not stand on Scripture, but rather let's live under it. Well, step one is, the, is recognize that the Bible study is important. I'm going to preach a series called, That's Not in the Bible, one of these days. I'm going to look at some of these phrases like, God helps those who help themselves. Did you know that's not in the Bible? God works in mysterious ways. That's not in the Bible. This too shall pass, not in Scripture. Money is the root of all evil. That's not in Scripture. God will not give you more than you can handle. Oh, my goodness. I've been overwhelmed a few times in my life. There are all kinds of things that we just believe as gospel truth. It's not even in the Bible. We need to unpack that. We need to understand that. Bible study is important. So by the way, if you don't know God's word for your life, could I challenge you today? You should start. You should get to know what he has to say to you in his word. Could I share with you five things to start doing? If you want to live under Scripture, Here's five things that you should start doing if you're not doing these already. Number one, believe it. Believe what God's Word says. The Bible is very clear in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. There's no point in reading the Bible if you don't plan to also believe it. And when you read, make an effort to believe what it says. Sometimes it won't make sense. Definitely not at first blush, at first reading. Sometimes it'll contradict what you previously believed. Sometimes you'll doubt. This is where you have to have the privilege of asking the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you for help. He'll open your eyes to help you genuinely believe the words that you're reading. Number two, believe what the Word says and remember key truths from Scripture. You can apply the Bible to your life by remembering key 
things. Remember promises and principles and commandments and prayers. Don't just read it. Take it to heart and listen for what God might be saying to you through it. Number three, allow Scripture to expose sin. Um, This was an issue that the Pharisees had. Jesus pointed out, hey, you who is without sin, you cast the first stone. They had not done that good and important heart work yet. If he, or Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Do you let Scripture reveal your own sin issues? And then do you do something about it by confession and asking God to lead you and help you? Number four, pray about what you've read. Praying takes this and moves it from the head, in my opinion, to the heart. We listen to God through Scripture And then we talk with God. And then we listen more to God as we pray it out with him. Number five, align your life with what the Bible says. Could I just point out, I've spent five weeks bagging on the Pharisees. They actually took a good step toward that principle. They did know the Bible well. Backwards and forwards, they knew the Torah first five books of the Bible, they had them memorized backwards and forwards. They did this pretty well. That was a strength of theirs, at least in part. Can I point this out to you? You shouldn't stop. We, we've said this. You, uh, Bible study is important. You should start if you haven't. And by the way, you shouldn't stop. You should be a lifelong learner. I would call you toward that. You heard Tony say something a bit ago about October 1st. Would you do us a favor and do make it a point to be here that night? October 1st, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. that night, we're going to gather in this space. We've got all kinds of fun stuff planned literally all over the building. You don't want to miss it. Make it a part of your fall. We're going to talk that night about a spiritual um, growth journey that we're going to launch a few weeks after that which will be a brilliant time if you're not connected in a small group. We want to get you connected in a small group then. There's an opportunity for spiritual growth this fall, and we're going to lean in a big way into into it that night. You shouldn't stop studying the Bible. You should be a lifelong learner. Can I give you a caution, though? Bible study isn't an end in and of itself. Let me challenge you on the backside of that. Bible study is simply a means to an end. What's the end? Your Bible study goal, every time you crack the spine of your Bible, should literally be Jesus. Bible study is important, but let's keep the main thing the main thing. Your Bible study goal every time is to connect with Jesus. Why? Because the whole Bible points toward Jesus. The Old Testament is pointing forward toward him. The Pauline epistles and the other letters in the New Testament are pointing back to the Gospels and the work that he did on the cross for us. I tried to make this point subtly last week. I was talking about the prophet Micah, and I was talking about how Jesus was confronting the Pharisees. And he loosely paraphrased, this is a mind trip to think about this. Several hundred years before that, Jesus spoke through the prophet Micah. And then a few hundred years later, he's speaking the same words out of his own mouth in the flesh form. But oh, the whole Old Testament, the word for it is theophany. Jesus' sightings in the Old Testament. If you read your Bible through that lens, if you're looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, you find him everywhere. The Pharisees had missed this point. What's our passage in verse 34? You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. If you look for Jesus in the Old Testament, you find him. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You're missing life that's staring you right in the face. Jesus is life. Any of you fans of the Ted Lasso show that I've come to love and appreciate, 
There's a character in there, Danny Rojas, and every time I hear him say, soccer is life. He's a Mexican soccer star. Yeah, okay, I get it. I get what you're saying. Through a spiritual lens, through a Bible study lens, Jesus is life. He says this very clearly in John chapter 10, verse 10. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That's why I'm here, he said. What's our verses again? Verse 39, you study the scriptures. You think that in them you're going to have eternal life, but it's me. Look for me in your Bible. He says this very clearly in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. He says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give each person according to what they have done. He says, I'm the Alpha. I'm the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning, and I'm the end, the entirety of Scripture. Really, it's about Jesus. Don't miss him because you're standing on Scripture. Find him. As you live under Scripture, by the way, any goal above Jesus is an idol. False worship, idolatry, oh boy, I do think it's possible to elevate the act of Bible study in your life above Jesus. And when we do, that's idolatry. That's false worship. Might I point out that self can become an idol as well. When I show up to a Bible study and I've done the work so that I can prove to you how smart I am, how much I know, how much knowledge I have swelled my brain with, and that puffs up my heart, that puffs up myself, that can become idolatry. It's not an act of worship or using the Bible as a vehicle to get to Jesus. Rather, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says it very clearly. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Last week, we looked at those 12 statements of a recovering Pharisee. Let's go ahead and put the first one up right now. I admit that my single most unmitigated pleasure is to judge other people. Step one is admitting we have a problem. Last week I said we need to move from we to I. I would encourage you this week it's time to move from I to he. And when I recognize that number one is I admit that I have a problem, if I do that, that I'm recognizing that I don't want to judge people because of what it's doing in my heart, but rather I want to not judge people because I want to get closer to Jesus. And my judgmental attitude is hurting my access to the proximity of Jesus in my life. He's standing right here. He's staring me in the face. I don't want to miss him because of my judgmental heart. If you haven't done this yet, before this series wraps, and oh my goodness, it's getting ready to end. This is the last message in this series. This afternoon, would you spend some time, and they're in the notes, looking through those 12 steps for a recovering Pharisee to admit Would you even look underneath them and see how often have you put the Bible in there and you're thumping Scripture, you're standing on Scripture rather than living underneath it? Hi, my name is Stan, and I'm a recovering Pharisee most days. Some days I relapse. I take three steps backwards and I pray to God that he invites me to take two or three more steps forward. How are you doing in your recovery? This is a lifelong process. Those of us who grew up inside the church that are recovering Pharisees, some of us, we know that we're in recovery. We talked about this the first week and we simply need accountability. Some of us, we have not stepped into recovery yet. Well, maybe there's an action step in there somewhere. Some of us, praise God, we don't need to admit that we're a recovering Pharisee because we've not been around the church long enough to struggle with this problem. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. The longer you walk with Jesus, the more extra things you start to pile on top of that. And human nature gets in and works its way in and guard your heart. Some of us, you're not in recovery yet, because you haven't taken the first step of faith yet. 
I love that you're here today. Do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. When the service is done, under the cross, we'll be hanging out. We'd love nothing more than to encourage you and to pray with you, help you take that first step of faith. We want to walk with you in this journey that Jesus is calling you on. Right now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes, and let's, let's go to him in prayer.